the researchers and guards scream in terror as the creatures run rampant through the factory. Nobody ever imagined they could be so dangerous, and all for a little live entertainment. The janitor rolls his mop cart down the hall of his brand new workplace. It's his first day on the job, and he would never let anyone hear him admit it, but he's a little bit nervous. The building is a huge, fancy research facility, an intimidating, sprawling building bustling with researchers in lab coats, executives in suits, and dozens of security guards. The previous place he'd worked had cubicles in a break room with a 20-year-old coffee machine, and this place had state-of-the-art technology and keycard locks on every door. Still, he was here to do a job, and that's what he was going to do. Though he was getting distracted by the intensity of the place when there are spills to clean, and apparently, there's a big one. As soon as the janitor had clocked in, a researcher had rushed over to tell him that he was desperately needed on one of the lower levels. So here he was, rolling his cart toward the elevator, holding the researcher's keycard in his hand. His own won't work to take him down to the appropriate level. His security clearance isn't high enough. He wonders, idly, why this company has such tight security, but figures that it isn't his job to ask that sort of question. Instead, he enters the elevator, swipes the card, and hits the button for LG-1. The elevator doors open with a ding, and the janitor wheels his cart out. Right away, he notices something off about this level. There are rows of massive glass boxes, filled with what look like giant fuzzy puppets. He can hear the usual sounds of chatter and footsteps, but there's also the clucking of chickens, the bleat of a goat. Are there farm animals down here? Maybe that's the source of the mess they were talking about, test subject animals or something. He continues past the glass boxes, searching for someone who can direct him toward the mess. As he walks, he feels dozens of eyes on him and stops to glance over his shoulder. His stomach drops as he sees that the creatures he thought were puppets have moved. They turn to face him as he passed by, eyes locked onto his back. Whatever these things are, they're alive and they're all watching him. He shudders but continues walking. At the other side of the hall, he can see a huge red spill on the tile floor. His footsteps quicken as he approaches the spill, and a metallic smell fills his nose. He had assumed it was some sort of leakage from machinery, but now, up close, he can tell it's blood. That's it. No paycheck is worth whatever is going on here. He turns to leave, abandoning the mop cart, and comes face to face with a giant furry thing at least eight feet tall. It grins down at him, reaching toward him with outstretched arms. Before he can run, it wraps those arms around him and pulls him into an inescapable, bone-crushing hug. He struggles, but he can't break free. He can't breathe. The air squeezed from his lungs. In a halting, inhuman voice, the monster says, Teamwork makes the dream work. Then, everything goes black. About one week after that janitor's ill-fated first day at work, the local police station received a video transmission from an unidentified man reporting an emergency at the facility. No further information was given, other than the exact location of the facility and the insistence that help be sent as quickly as possible. When the police arrived, however, they quickly realized that the situation was above their pay grade and contacted an organization much more experienced with handling unusual occurrences the SCP Foundation. The Foundation quickly arrived, administered amnestics to all witnesses, and investigated the area. There, they found something unlike anything they had ever seen before, and for the SCP Foundation, that was saying something. All human personnel at the facility had been terminated, or were missing altogether. There was still activity present in the building, however, though none of it was human. There were anomalous creatures roaming the facility uninhibited, they did not resemble humans or any known animals, but instead looked more like costumed characters from a children's television show, along the lines of Sesame Street or Barney. The site manager's office was completely empty of any files, and all hard drives found within had been wiped. Every surface had been sterilized and cleaned to remove any DNA evidence or fingerprints. The anomalous creatures were promptly captured, though they did not go without a fight. Several of the creatures were heard moving through the vents and were unable to be removed due to their speed, agility, and excretion of caustic material. In the underground laboratory spaces of the facility, the Foundation agents discovered glass tubes filled with amniotic fluid in which underdeveloped specimens were being grown. 
Agents also discovered containment chambers made of bulletproof glass, as well as pens filled with deceased farm animals, including cows, chickens, and goats. Once the Foundation had rounded up all of the creatures, the facility was blocked off from the outside world and given the official designation SCP-3325. SCP-3325 is an abandoned facility belonging to Real Characters Industries. The facility includes a recording studio, a series of underground laboratories, staff living quarters, storage, containment areas, and an industrial-grade incinerator. There are also several administrative areas, as well as a helipad on the structure's roof. The containment areas are home to a collection of biologically engineered organisms that bear a cursory resemblance to puppets or human beings wearing plush costumes, like those seen on children's television shows. For research purposes, these organisms have been designated SCP-3325-1. Despite their colorful appearance, which could even be mistaken for inviting and wholesome from a distance, instances of SCP-3325-1 are incredibly hostile to humans and any other organisms outside their own species. Though they are vulnerable to attacks with conventional weapons, these creatures lack any sense of pain and will continue to go after an intended target until they are effectively destroyed. In addition to their penchant for aggression, the instances of SCP-3325-1 are carnivorous and will eat any meat they are given access to. Thankfully, these organisms lack reproductive organs, so there won't be any baby plush monsters running around anytime soon. Instances of SCP-3325-1 behave in an unpredictable manner, though their most common activities are either staring at personnel blankly for long stretches of time, attempting to attack them, or repeating assorted canned children's television-friendly phrases in voices that Foundation personnel have described as unsettling and disturbing. Over the course of the initial discovery and containment of SCP-3325, SCP Foundation staff created an observation log describing all known types of SCP-3325-1. The breakdown is as follows. SCP-3325-1A long neck avian organism with feathers, 3 meters tall. Its wings are redundant, unable to facilitate flight. Instances are able to reach a speed of approximately 72 kilometers an hour. Aggressive behavior patterns are similar to that of a cassowary. Instance frequently damages its beak by running into objects. Color varies. I've encountered cassowaries before while conducting field research and let me just say, the dinosaurs never really did die out. They live on in those monstrous birds. But I digress. SCP-3325-1b Bipedal reptilian organism, observed in colors of purple, green, and yellow. SCP-3325-1c Bipedal organism covered in fur, 1 meter tall, able to sprint at speeds of around 60 kilometers an hour, observed to attack in packs. Upon acquiring a target, an instance will vocalize a random phrase, which elicits aggressive behavior in other nearby instances. Color varies. SCP-3325-1D Unknown organism that hides in vents. Object is able to secrete and project a corrosive fluid. The appearance of the organism is unknown. Specimens have yet to be obtained. SCP-3325-1E Bipedal reptilian organism, 5 meters tall. Constantly sings in a distorted voice. The lyrics of its song are unintelligible, presumably due to malformed vocal cords. Only one instance has been encountered. The other observed variety of SCP-3325-1 is not one specific type of organism, but rather a collection of malformed creatures characterized by the presence of conditions that, in any other organism, would cause death shortly after, if not during birth. These include but are not limited to necrosis, missing skin, tumors, additional organs in places where they shouldn't be, or other life-threatening deformations. As you might imagine, the appearance of specimens with this classification varies greatly. Following my initial research into SCP-3325, several addenda were added to the official file, consisting of several pieces of pertinent and often troubling media. The first was a brochure discovered on the floor of the facility, depicting a dissatisfied crying child standing next to a puppet in contrast to an image of the same child laughing and clapping in the presence of an SCP-3325-1 specimen. In addition to these images, the brochure contains this text. In today's world, children are bored of animation, puppets, costumes, and even the once groundbreaking computer-generated graphics. They've seen it all. They know it's all fake. 
Children nowadays want more, but what is the next step in the entertainment industry? Think outside the box. We're not talking about puppets or any of those materials children know are fake. We, as humans, inherently need to associate with living, breathing creatures, not puppets or moving pictures. We're talking about real characters. Our goal is to provide children with characters that are alive, that will teach them how to manage their emotions and solve life problems realistically. You can't get more real than that. During a subsequent sweep of the facility grounds, an SCP Foundation employee discovered a videotape wedged between the wall and a large papier-mâché apple. Scrawled in pen across the tape's case were the words, We shouldn't have played God. A transcript of the videotape's contents is included in the file's second addendum, which I will attempt to summarize for you now. The video depicts an unidentified woman standing next to a green instance of the cassowary-like avian species of SCP-3325-1. Two men stand behind the camera, directing the action. Context clues suggest that this tape was intended to serve as a demonstration of the facility's characters, possibly for potential clients or investors. At the start of the video, the woman expresses discomfort with the bird-like creature, which stares at her, still and unblinking. She is instructed to say her lines as scripted, but when action is called and the actress begins to speak, the creature bites her arm. One of the men steps in front of the camera to intervene, but the entity does not respond to his commands. Even when the man begins to strike the creature with a baton, it does not budge. Instead, it bites down harder and harder until blood is drawn. Security is called, and the footage is cut short. After the first tape was discovered, the Foundation conducted several more sweeps of the property in an attempt to locate any additional media they may have missed the first time. During a search of the security room, an officer's backpack was located. It contained several personal items, including a very expired yogurt, a Nicholas Sparks novel, and a bag of sour cream and onion chips. At the bottom of the bag, however, another tape was found. This one appeared to have been surveillance footage captured by security cameras. This was particularly notable, given that all other surveillance footage found at the facility had been destroyed or corrupted, most likely deliberately. To this date, this is the only security footage successfully recovered from SCP-3325. The footage depicts two figures, presumably security guards, standing on a catwalk, looking down at containment pens filled with instances of SCP-3325-1. Each guard holds a long pole with a device attached to the tip, appearing to function similarly to a taser or a cattle prod. The guards talk amongst themselves, joking about shocking the creatures for fun. One guard points out a particular instance of SCP-3325-1, which is standing still and staring dead ahead. The other guard points out another stagnant creature, which appears to be staring directly at the other guard. Disquieted by this, the guard decides to knock the entity's hat off of its head. He grabs an empty bottle, throwing it at the instance. The bottle collides with the hat, but the item does not budge. Instead, it breaks open and begins to bleed, revealing it to be a part of the creature's body rather than a costume piece. The two guards begin to panic at the sight of the security camera before asking Danny in the security room to take the tape. The second guard admonishes the first for his behavior, and the footage cuts. The next addendum to the SCP-3325 file is, in the opinion of this researcher, the most disturbing. Field agents retrieved 79 steel containers from a storage area on the bottom floor of the facility. 41 of these containers contained human bodies preserved in a formaldehyde solution. Additionally, each container had documents attached, detailing each person's name and position at the company, as well as the cause of their death. Causes of death listed included mauling, organ failure, necrosis, and scheduled termination. SCP-3325 is classified as Euclid. Currently, SCP-3325 is contained on site, surrounded by a fence and guarded by no fewer than four security guards at any given time. Due to the isolated nature of the location, no further security measures have been deemed necessary. As for the specimens of SCP-3325-1, they are kept in large animal containment cells at a research sector whose precise designation has been redacted from official files. Each of these containment cells has an audio recording device inside. Each specimen is to be fed twice a day on a diet of raw meat, and no direct interaction between research staff and these specimens is permitted without first tranquilizing the entity. The effort to locate and contain all pieces of equipment associated with SCP-3325, as well as any documents pertaining to it, is an ongoing project. 
At this time, it's uncertain if any of us will ever know what real characters industries was up to, and when it turned from an attempt to revolutionize the children's entertainment market to something far more sinister. What did the researchers discover that signed their eventual death warrants? Was the project truly abandoned, or just moved deeper underground to a new facility staffed with fresh faces who won't ask too many questions? One thing is certain. Be wary of cuddly new characters that appear at theme parks, at birthday parties, and on screen in the coming years. It's possible that these creatures are just actors in suits or life-size puppets, and all they want is a hug. But it's also possible that their wide, vacant eyes and friendly smiles hide an uncontrollable rage, an unpredictable intelligence, and a thirst for blood. Check out the Dr. Bob Patreon and become a junior researcher today. Now go and watch another entry from the files of Dr. Bob, like SCP-674, The Exposition Gun Makes Nintendo Real Life.